Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Carrie Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. Tom, welcome back to the podcast. It is a delight to be with you. Always great to be with you, Carrie. And boy, I have fun talking with you before we hit the record button, whether it's uh, about church life or whether it's about our lives, whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah. to me. Well, likewise, and uh, thanks for having me on your podcast. Tell us about well, that. That's fine. Yeah, that was great. Yours is short, right? I'm the guy who just goes on forever, but um, <laughs> tell us about your podcast. Well, the podcast is called Rainer on Leadership, and I don't know how long it's been. You've been doing that for years, right? Yeah, it's been around a long, long time. And uh, for many years, Jonathan Howe was my co-host. I remember. And, yeah. And he was... He was the straight man in many ways, and it was <laughs> so much fun. And when Jonathan ended up taking another job, of course, I grieved over his departure. But that gave me the opportunity to work with my son, Sam. I know. Sam has another podcast called The EST. But this has this just been really good. And, and he, he's a natural. He is just an absolute. Yeah. Natural. Yeah, you can sense that. I have, I have a son named Sam, and I get to work with him as well. So he joined our company over a year ago. And it's been more in the background, but uh, that, that can actually work. What are some keys to working with family? Open you? communication, willingness to be forthright with one another in the context of that open communication, yeah. setting clear, clear expectations, probably even more so than your other employees, yeah. uh, lest they think that uh, dad will give me a little breathing room over here. I can edge over here. And uh, then taking feedback from them. I listen to my sons, Carrie. Of course, mm -hmm. I listen to my wife. All three sons are somehow involved with me, uh, sound right. more than the other two. But uh, when, I, when I need a sounding board, they're, they're my advisory group. I mm -hmm. go to them first. They're ages 40, 38, and 35. So they're, they're mature men. And they're, they, they are just absolutely incredible. And um, the blessing of them giving me 11 grandchildren is kind of a bonus. Hey, that's, that's pretty neat. Yeah. But you're right. You know, family can either be wonderful or it can be horrible. And you, you know, the horrible stories always make the news, but that's good to hear that that is a joy. I don't think this is his, my Sam's permanent life goal, but uh, it's great for a season. I've been really enjoying it. What my boys have always been able to tell me and act out is that they have no sense of entitlement. Mm. And, and they, they've been that way all of their lives. So just because they're with dad on his program, his ministry and his business, they have no sense that they are entitled to it. They, they said, dad, you've always told us if we're going to succeed, we're going to work at it. And that includes with you as well. I love their hearts for that. Yeah. No, I think you're right. If you're a relative somehow of the founder, owner, pastor, whatever, it's almost like, yeah, at least in the initial period, work twice as hard just to earn the respects of your colleagues. I remember my dad wanted me to take over his business when he was 16, when I was 16. And it was a tool and mold shop. And I'm not very good at math. And so, you know, you're, you're machining uh, metal down to a thousandth of an inch. And uh, I worked in the shop. I worked on the machines. I cleaned the toilets. I enjoyed cleaning the toilets a lot more than working on the machines because I knew how to do that. But I remember saying to him, Dad, I think I could run the office, which was like three people at the time, said, I think I could run the office, but I know I would never have the respect of the, the guys on the floor unless I knew how to build a mold. And so I said, I don't think I can run the office because they, I can't figure out the X, Y axis on, you know, down to a thousandth of an inch. So I left that. But yeah, there is that sense that you almost have to work twice as hard uh, if you're related. So you have a chance now with Church Answers to serve so many local church pastors, and you've been doing this your whole life. Um, I, I've been asking a lot of guests this question in 2020, but uh, I'm going to ask you for your view in a moment. But I want to know, the pastors that you're seeing, 
Are they seeing the crisis of 2020 more as an interruption or a disruption? Unfortunately, more of them are seeing it as an interruption. Yeah. If you're seeing it as an interruption, what you're doing is you're waiting for normal to come back. Yeah. And normal is not going to come back. I don't even like the phrase new normal because you still have the noun, even though you put an adjective in front of it. It's, it's, it's a new reality. And hmm. I would say this is all anecdotal, but we have conversations with hundreds, if not thousands of church leaders every single week in a different different types of venue. And I would say about three-fourths of them are holding on to something normal returning. And that, as much as anything else, is what frightens me about local churches, little c, yeah. as, as we move forward in this, uh, this uh, post-quarantine era. Yeah, so I, I sense your answer would be a little bit different than the answer you hear three quarters. And I would say from, you know, the the pastors I've talked to, the church leaders I've talked to, that seems pretty accurate. About 75% are holding on for some form of going back to normal and saying, no, this is definitely an interruption. I've run into business leaders, too, who just think it's an interruption, not a disruption. So, And think about where you're spending your time when you're doing that. If you perceive that it's an interruption, you're spending your resources, your focus, your mental, emotional, and spiritual energy on returning to that normal when God may be telling you, I've got you in a new era and a new area and a new land, and you need to be spending your time resources on that instead of trying to return to something that does not exist. We cannot keep crying that we want to go back to Egypt because all we'll get is a wilderness if we do so. We need to move toward that promised land. Hmm. So you see it differently. Why do you, I'm going to, take it that you see this as a disruption, and I'd love to know why. Why do you think this is a disruption? What are the factors? One of the major factors is that the pandemic accelerated everything that was going on. Yeah. So when we see attendance patterns be incredibly reduced and disrupted themselves, some people will say, we didn't see it coming. Well, you probably would have had much of the same thing three to four years from now, had there not been a pandemic. So yeah. there, was a, there was an acceleration of trends. That One of the great news, pieces of great news about the pandemic is the acceleration that took place opened our eyes to the reality that it was there. Hmm. I love the beach. I love yeah. I, I, Cape San Blas is uh, a beach that few people know about, and I just absolutely love been going there for two decades but it has an erosion problem. Yeah. But if you watch it every week, that erosion is so incredibly subtle. But when Hurricane Michael hit mm. 20, well, two years ago, when, when, when Hurricane Michael hit, all of a sudden the erosion was dramatic and people are saying, look at these beaches. We're, but they would have gotten that way anyway. And yeah. restoration was necessary regardless. I love the fact that the pandemic has awakened us to the reality that we need to change. So it is, it is a disruption in the sense that things have been accelerated. It is a disruption in the sense that the mission field has been clarified. For many of us, the mission field was the, the holy huddle on a Sunday morning. And we wouldn't have said that was our mission field, but that's where we spent our time and our energy. That's, yeah. where, that's where we did all these things that uh, took up 80% of who we are, preparing sermons and, and being with people and pastoral care, the important things. But we were neglecting the fact that there was this huge, huge mission field that we were not seeing that is digital. And so one of the greatest benefits of the disruption is now we see that or now we should see that. And when, when, when people say, what is a good sign of a church that has made this shift? I would say more than the action, as important as actions are, is when the mindset has changed from the digital world being a tool to the digital world being the mission field. Hmm. Once that mindset takes place, we treat, we act, and we respond to that world differently than if it's just another tool to have streaming services or Facebook ads or something of that nature. So hmm. when the mindset shifted, those become the 25 or 20 percent of the leaders that are ready for the disruption and the blank slate that is before them. Hmm. So one of the things you and I have talked about uh, recently is, you know, so many leaders seem to want to get back to normal. 
It's just like, hey, let's just reopen as much as we can. We'll get back to normal. Um, neither you nor I think normal is coming back. I'd love to know, why do you think there seems to be this scramble among the majority of leaders to go back to normal? Go, let's go back to pre-COVID and let, hmm. let's look at some of the problems or let's say challenges we had as leaders. And since I connect with a lot of pastors whose churches are under 300 in attendance, I, I see this specifically with many of the church members there. One of the primary challenges these leaders would have is if they made a change, what you and I would think would be a methodological change, whether it's in the physical facilities or the worship service or something like that, there would be an outcry. And right. I would be, my church is changing. Normal was defined by their perception of what a church is and right. should be. And when you disrupted that, you would get conflict. Now, what we haven't seen for many of us leaders, many leaders, is that the pandemic got us away from our comfort level as well. We were talking about our church members not being uh, receptive to change. We're now discovering, many of our leaders are now discovering that we are not ready for that new world. I mean, what's, hmm. what will many pastors do if they have three times as many people that are watching and listening to their messages digitally as in person? You know, what will pastors do when, when groups take on a whole new model that you've never seen before? Right. That's, that's draining to many pastors. They are losing the church they know. They are losing the church for which they have found comfort. And it's easy for me to be a bit judgmental about it and say, no, you got you to gotta do differently. But that's the human nature. Hmm. We love our routines. We love our comfort. And we have really jerked a lot of the pandemic has jerked a lot of leaders out of that routine and comfort. Yeah. What, um, talk a little bit more about that, Tom. Um, I, guess, I guess, you know, in the evangelical movement, it's a little bit conservative theologically, but it also seems to be conservative methodologically. We do um, the two, don't we? We really do. And as much as you write about it, I write about it. We talk about it. It's like, it, it, it's hard to do, right? Like, you look at podcasting, we're, we're doing this interview and people ask me, are you going to do podcasting forever? And my answer, you know, despite how well things have gone is like, no, I don't think I'm doing it forever. What I'm committed to is bringing conversations with great leaders to the public sphere. That's what I'm committed to right now. Podcasting is a really good way to do it, but I'm sure there's some technology nobody's thought of or is in development in, you know, Menlo Park right now or, or, uh, or Cupertino, that's going to be the next thing. And then podcasting will go the way of Periscope or, you know, some of these other, remember Periscope? And every, Periscope was a new thing. And, you know, I'm going to do my daily Periscope show at 12 noon central. And, you know, then, and then it's like, well, that was a blip, right? But we've, but people, okay, here's, here's something. I'd love to hear your take on this. Some people would say, yeah, Carrie, great. Go on, go on, and go on about that stuff. But here's the reality. Public worship has been part of the practice of Christians for thousands of years, uh, arguably in the current form since the Reformation with some variations. So you can't tell me that that's going away anytime soon. Have you heard that? And what would you say to that? I would say it's going to change dramatically. I do not think in-person worship is going away. Right. I, I, right. I think that that... Like, you remember 30 years ago when multiple worship services were controversial? Everybody should be gathered. You know, I really don't, but you probably you probably remember that better than I do. I'm older than you are. I remember, <laughs> I remember well, as a matter of fact. I rem you know what? I, you, you took me to a place, like a, a not very well-traveled path in my brain. I remember when two services were seen as splitting the church. Okay, that's where you're going. Yep. That's where when multiple services were controversial in themselves because we had gotten away from the Reformation model of one worship service at a certain time, and there's still some who are arguing for that. And then when we went to multiple venue, multiple site, uh, it really started to shrug. A little, little side note here. I went multi-site as a pastor in 1980, 1992. Hmm. Uh, 
the only other church that I knew of that was multi-site at the time was Perimeter Church in Atlanta. I didn't know yeah. any others. Maybe there was a church of God somewhere that uh, was also multi-site. I want to tell you, Carrie, I was labeled heretical because, and you know, I went multi-site not because I did something cool or I was prescient. I did multi-site because we'd run out of space and couldn't do any more services with the park mm-hmm. there. So I said, well, why can't we go four miles down the road? Well, we can't, we can't do that. So anyway, back, back to, you know, where, where we are right now. I know I'm, I know I'm going down all these uh, paths, but where we are right now is we will ultimately see the in-person service be one manifestation of the gathered church, yeah. not the manifestation of the gathered church. And that's, that's troubling some people right now because that's not the world that we knew back in January of 2020. And it's right. a rapid change. Well, I've been thinking about that too, because I've been doing, you know, worship off my iPad phone laptop for six months in part because even as a founding pastor, there were strict limits on how many people could be at our production facility thanks to quarantine. So I couldn't go if I wanted to. And I've fallen into that rhythm. And I've, I've had lots of people on my platform say online attendance is not attendance. It doesn't count. What, what is your take on that? It does count. <laughs> <laughs> That, that is my simple response. And you have done as good a job as anyone I know about what counts counts, you know? Just, yeah. Yeah. The whole, it's like Sears asking if Amazon counts, right? It's like, well, it kind of counts, it, you know? It does. Uh, I think that that is not only part of the gathered church, but that is part of the mission field that yeah. is the future of the churches. So if we begin to say they don't really count, what we're ultimately saying is that is not the mission field we wish to pursue. While some Mm. may be followers of Christ, many of them are not. And if there's anything that has been waning in the North American church in particular, it has been conversion growth. They're seeing people come to Christ. Yeah, you know that. Followers of Christ in the church. Why? Because our mission field has been three people me, myself, and I, and maybe them, so four. And, and it's just been us. Now we're seeing a new mission field. And if we are not counting these, we're, might, we're basically saying reaching people does not count. Worshiping with others yeah. does not count. Yes, it counts. Uh, I'll let Karen, you have to decide how to measure it. But yes, it counts. Well, it's interesting because I'm sitting in my backyard, Tom, thinking, you know, and you can't really see your neighbors. You're going to mask up or whatever. But that, that season is, is coming to an end at some point in the foreseeable future. And I'm like, am I more effective in my backyard making connections with the people I live around and the people in my life than I am trying to get them to go to a building? And listen, I'm the guy who built the building. So, you know, I've, I've got a vested interest in both. And I'm just, I'm rethinking the home as the hub for the future ministry. Why do you think we are so addicted to our buildings? Or do you think we're addicted to buildings? That was a pretty lawyer-like leading question. It's not a trap. We, we, we are addicted to our gatherings. We mm-hmm. have measured success by a number of people in a facility. Therefore, the facility became important because we measure by the numbers who were there. We yeah. measure by those who were gathered for worship. We measure by those. Many of them were in on-campus small groups or even in the traditional church at Sunday school. The metrics of our success depended upon the building. And because it depended upon the building, the building took on an importance that was far greater than it should have been and it certainly will be in the future. And so, gosh, Kerry, we could, we could talk at length about conversations both of us have had with design build firms and those who know facilities well and are looking toward the future. And prior to COVID, they were, they were talking about the major trend was reducing the size of worship centers, sanctuaries. And now they're saying everything has changed. The, the whole idea of the facilities have changed. I was recently in a church in the Atlanta area. And it was a large facility because they had bought out a closed shopping center and a shopping center that had closed. And uh, the pastor was walking me around and uh, he was showing where something new was about to be built. I said, what's going to be there? And he said, um, 
uh, those where the washing machines and dryers are going to be. And I said, excuse me? He said, yeah, we, we have a lot of people in our community who do not have washers and dryers, and we're going to let them come in for free, and we're going to provide child care at certain points and uh, get their clothes cleaned. Hmm. I learned later that that became a booming ministry. He said, now over here is the uh, uh, police precinct. I said, what? Because this is still in the framing stage. He said, yeah, this is where the uh, local police are going to actually have a small precinct located. Um, this was pre-COVID. And I'm thinking, this guy gets it. Hmm. This guy absolutely gets it. If we're going to have a building, let it be for the community and let it be something that the community embraces instead of a building that merely says, y'all come and satisfy us with your presence. That, I got excited just watching that. He was, a pre, he was a pre-COVID pastor before being post-COVID was cool. I think I said that. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to know, you know, if, if you could just get leaders together and let's think average sized churches and people who are going back to normal or trying to, you know, regather as many people as possible, which is still not going well, you know, 20, 30, 40% of the former gathering is, is happening. And if you could tell them anything, what would you tell them? What would you want to, you know, very politely just kind of shake them up and go, guys, like pay attention. What, what would you tell them? I would tell them that they will not have a church in five years if they don't embrace the new reality of which they're a part. And I would just look them right in the face and I would say, you're either going to close or you're going to be so discouraged that uh, you're going to walk away. Hmm. I did a uh, blog post sometime back, uh, September, I think. And uh, it was simply entitled, Why Your Pastor is About to Quit. I remember I read that one. It's a great post. We'll link to it. And it's, it's one of those, that, you know, you wake up that morning when it's released and it's gone viral. And it's just, it's, it's all over the place. And I thought I would have hit a nerve. I just did not know that nerve was that sensitive. Hmm. You know, why is it, why is it that somewhere around 80% of pastors are contemplating quitting? Wow. Why is it in this post-COVID era? And it's because they don't know the world in which they are leading and ministering. Yeah. I would get those people in front of me and I would say, you are no longer in Kansas. Yeah. Now it's time to wake up and see this new mission field. Imagine that you have been trained and lift. I'm thinking about the most recent other country I've been to, Uganda. Let's, let's just let's say that uh, you've been in Entebbe and you wake up and you have to minister in Entebbe. I don't think you're going to do that the way you did that in Birmingham, Alabama. Hmm. Let's look at this new culture. Let's look at this new world. And let's ask the question, what does it take in God's power to reach, minister and care in this new culture? Um, obviously there's been a lot of dislocation. There are a few leaders that are thriving, but I, I think you're right. That 80%, is that like a guess or you have a stat that like you're pretty sure 80% are going to quit? A survey that we did through social media. So wow, it's not Barner scientifically uh, <laughs> uh, approved, but it's, you sh it, it was well over a thousand people that responded. No, and listen, I, I track with David pretty closely, and he says the emotional health of church leaders is at an all-time historic abnormal low. Like, yeah, so scientific or, you know, the, the quick poll. It's anecdotal. No, but that, that, that's, no, I think that's very real. I did, I did a poll pre-COVID at a push pay event in Dallas in May of 2019, and they wanted me to live poll the room. So there's like 800 church leaders, and I asked them, how many of you, and self self describe, but how many of you have experienced signs of burnout in the last twelve months? And it was something like ninety six percent of people in the room put their hands up, and I stopped. I almost started crying. I'm that's like, pre COVID, right? That's pre COVID. This is like a year before the whole thing, and I'm like, so it was already fragile. There was already a tinder box, and um, what are so talk to the pastor who's ready to quit or the leader who's, who's ready to quit and goes, Tom, I haven't, I haven't got the skills for this. Okay. I'm not, I didn't learn this in seminary. I, I didn't train for this. I don't have the staff for this. I don't know where the budget is going. Is there anything you would say to them to help them hang in there? 
they are in good company. Hmm. We're 11 men who were not equipped to take on the world. And they would eventually become 12 and then 120 and it would grow. They were fishermen. Uh, they were tax collectors. They were the least likely in a hostile Greco-Roman culture that was not ready to receive the gospel message. And in God's power and in God's grace, those handful of people, as you well know, the New Testament makes it clear, they changed the world. Now, here's wow. that I tried to remind pastors of. They had the Internet in the first century. And now people look at me like a, what in the world are you talking about? Okay, they had the internet equivalent in the first century. Had the Roman roads not been built the previous two centuries, completed, it had started before that, but it completed in the, those previous two centuries and were ready as they were, primarily for warfare, some, sometime for commerce, but Roman Empire holding its power together, from a human perspective, the gospel would not have carried. It would have carried over sea, but not over land. And so most of the known Roman Empire would not have been reached if it was not for those Roman roads. Yeah. Those Roman roads were radical in that day. They had proper drainage. They had, they had cleared through forests. They went over waterways. It was a technological marvel of that day. And instead of looking at the Roman roads and saying that the, the dirty Roman government has messed up our land, the early followers of Christ said, we have this uh, new communication system in this culture that is not friendly to Christianity. And let's see what we can do in God's power. Start looking at the first century church. I got a book that I have read now, I think 22 times. It's the only book that I have read that much other than the Bible itself. And it's called Evangelism in the Early Church by Michael Green, who was first published in 1970. And every time I read that book, Carrie, I am reminded that 2020 was not anything new. There's always been this time when there has been major disruption. We've just had a long period where we've gotten too comfortable. Mm. This is almost normal. I don't want to use that word. This is almost closer to what we have been experiencing historically than just the fact that we have been disrupted. So, this is an opportunity to be like the first church and uh, just go back and read Acts 2 and begin with verse, and read it all, but uh, begin with verse 41 and start going forward and just see what happens uh, to the early church. This is the mission field. This is the great opportunity that is there. I love that you went to the New Testament on that rather than just some principles. Uh, I went to Rome last year for the first time, only time in my life, and stood on the Appian Way just outside of the gates of the city of Rome. And those are the gates that Peter and Paul would have gone through. There's a little plaque commemorating that this is where Peter had a vision of God before he went back into Rome to be um, crucified upside down, according to tradition. And, you know, that's, that's where Paul walked. And to actually be on the road that they walked uh, was pretty amazing. But that was a completely different model than temple worship which was facility centric versus, you know, home based. So it's a really interesting parallel that you draw. So you've already alluded to this. Uh, neither of us are 25 year old leaders. Can we say that just for argument's sake? You can say you're closer to it than I am. <laughs> you strike me as very resilient. You've had a lot of change in your life. You've led different churches. You've led a major organization. You pivoted to church answers over the last couple of years. Um, you're a podcaster, you're an author, you're, you, you've done so many different things. Why does this not threaten you? you? You would think that someone with decades of experience would say, we've got to get back to the way it was. Why, why are you excited about the opportunities? I'm excited about the opportunities. One reason is because that is the way that God prepared me through my parents. And let, let me just give a little bit of, of background. So you can, yeah. and you probably didn't think I was going to go this way, but uh, you, just, just for the listener to know something maybe different about me, if they know anything about me, I was born and raised in South Alabama. Uh, most of my childhood was in the sixties. And for those who know the history of the United States in the 1960s, 
It was a volatile time. It was, uh, if, if we're looking at the racial unrest today, it was magnified during those days. And I was in the middle of it. Uh, I was halfway between Selma, Alabama and the Pettus Bridge in Tuskegee, Alabama. And I was a minority white person in an African-American town. Highly racist, uh, uh, really, really, really some ugly things took place against the, uh, the African-Americans that resided in our town. I was raised by a father who, whose mother died when he was 10 years old, my grandmother, wow. whose father took to alcoholism. And guess who came and raised my dad? African-Americans. Wow. My dad was raised by African-Americans. I was a minority white in a highly racist town that was taught by my dad that you can make it during these times because God is working through all people. And that has been a part of who I was. His World War II vet, he's a, he, he, he had multiple medals. Uh, he, he was my hero. Hmm. But that t- he taught me resilience. And what he taught me, and it is cliche, but he, he, put, he, he put it in my heart and my mind, is the circumstances will change, Tom, but the God who's going to use you has not, and he will hmm. continue to use you. So I'm sorry to go back and give that. No, that's a powerful story. Of Tom Rayner. I've, I've, I've done it very few times, but um, uh, it, it's, it's, it was my dad's reminder that uh, God always has a plan for us. The circumstances do not change that. And my dad was shot twice uh, over, over Germany uh, in a B-24. He, he, was, he was wounded for death on one occasion. And here, here, one other little thing, and boy, am I traveling. I'm giving too much bi- autobiography here, but one more little thing. He had not married my mother when he was in World War II. And he didn't make a deal with God, but he said, God, if I come back and I get to marry Nan, my mother, I will dedicate my children to serve you. So he, he told me that story on his deathbed, by the way. No way. Yeah. And so, oh. so the dad who raised me to understand that the God of all circumstances is in the post-COVID era. Hmm. And he can see you through this, Pastor. He can, it's not just he can see you through it. He can let you see this world. And if you'll be willing to open your eyes, instead of saying, we want the whole world back, he'll give it to you. So my hmm. apologies to the listeners. For- There's no apology needed. Thank you so much for sharing so personally. I love it. Love it to, when, when leaders do that and when, when you shared that way. What do you think some of the qualities and characteristics that have made you resilient are? And what would you be looking for? Would you say to leaders, hey, these are the skills you're going to need moving forward? Like, there are qualities and characteristics, I think, to resilient people. They are asking questions, what's next? Mm-hmm. You write a book. You know, you didn't see that coming. Yeah, 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 yeah. They, 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 they may not can predict the future, but they're always asking about the future. Yeah. And so if we... if we, Curiosity. Yeah. yeah, a lot of curiosity uh, as, as, as they uh, desire to, to move forward. Resilient leaders don't think that they can do it all themselves. Hmm. They, they depend upon teams. They depend upon other people. They depend upon, of course, they depend upon God. But uh, some of the greatest leaders I've known, I've said, tell me, tell me about your team. And I haven't met all your team, but one thing I know is that Kerry Newhoff has a great team. Because, I'm very fortunate that way. Yeah. And I do too. And they, they, they are, they've always great leaders who, that are resilient usually have these teams around them. Great leaders look for where God is working instead of where God is limiting. And hmm. pandemic is where God is working. He's not saying, Oh, I've shut the door. Church is not going to make it. Whether it's a little C church or the universal church is not going to make it. I've shut the door. Resilient leaders say, let me try to find out and see what God is doing here. Sounds almost a little bit like Henry Blackaby, but maybe it is. You know, let's find out where God is working and join him in it. And that's, you know, one Canadian to another between Blackaby and uh, Kerry Newhoff. Yeah. That's, 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 uh, those are some of the characteristics that I see. 
So I want to go through different church sizes with you because you have the unique perspective to talk to so many church leaders. So let's talk about the church of, say, 75 to 200 people, somewhere in that range. So you kind of know everybody still, you know the name, you're still doing pastoral care. It could be one service, two services, but, you know, which is what, 80% of the church in America, roughly, yep. is around that age or that size. What are some of the best and worst practices that you've seen in among church leaders of, of churches that size? Well, at the risk of redundancy, one of the worst practices I've seen is a desire to return to pre-COVID in a cultural church-like. I'm being redundant at this point, but uh, that, that would be true for leaders of uh, churches of all sizes. Another thing that I think that those in the small churches or smaller churches, uh, predominantly smaller churches are doing, is that they are looking at the attendance as their measure of success. Yeah. And if they had and I'm talking about in-person attendance, and if they had 75 gathered pre-COVID and they have 30 gathered now, they are feeling like failures. Yeah. And I, I want to tell them, no, you're not. Your people are still there. They're just in some different places right now. And let's adjust accordingly. So the attendance metric, I think, is more pervasive in the smaller churches because when you go from 75 to 30, it really feels like you've lost a lot of people as opposed from going from 800 to 400 to 500. You still have a good mass that is there. Oh, that's interesting. You know, I hadn't heard that point. That That's a really good point. Yeah. And you feel it. And those are names attached with people. It's like the Johnsons aren't there. The Smiths aren't there, right? Like Yes, exactly. So I, I would say to these pastors of these normative churches, hey, don't get hung up on the number before. Look at the mission field in front of you. Hmm. What, what are best practices? Have you seen some churches innovate in that um, normal sized church space? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen, I, I can think of one church right now in central Indiana that is running about 90 in attendance pre COVID. I don't know exactly what their post COVID number is or their post quarantine number is, but around 90 is below 100. Before COVID, they started a second campus, a rural mm. church. They started a second campus. Wow. After COVID, they have started micro churches, micro, uh, somewhat home churches, but they don't have to be in the home. Churches of around uh, 15 people, uh, 20 people, almost single cell. And I know, of, I know of one particular church that has said, you know, uh, we're going to use the digital world for our connection through worship, but we're going to have these smaller gatherings uh, that are just going to stay right where they are. And I've called them micro churches for right now because I don't have a better name for them. And I think that that is a trend for the future. And it could I agree. be for larger churches, but it certainly is for the smaller churches. Yeah. And, you know, I've seen large churches do that, but it's really cool to see small churches doing that. Let's talk about um, churches that are, and I know this is a huge range, but 200 to 1,000. So you're getting into mid-sized churches to larger churches at that point best and worst practices there? Anything that's different? I am seeing an obsession on the negative with some of these leaders with the facilities. Wow. The facilities are, are bigger and therefore they're more expensive. And I'm saying usually, I mean, think, think of a facility that holds maybe 700. That's a rather large gathering place. Yeah. And, and if there are 200 people there, they're not only worried about, the numbers who are there, they're worried about paying the bills. They're worried about the upkeep. They're worried about the look. Uh, and I can take this to mega churches too. Mega churches that have gone from 3,000 and plus to gathered attendance to 600 in, in, maybe, in maybe a facility that holds 2,000 or 2,500. They're looking at that and they're saying, oh my goodness, what do I do about these facilities? I, 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 know, I know of a pastor who, who built a facility, and um, I think the, the gathering size was only 350, and he had a studio connected to it, and he did this pre-COVID, and uh, I think, didn't that's what you did, Gary? Uh, yeah, 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 that that may have been what we did, yeah. And we basically how, built a broadcast studio. How smart studio. you seem now. Hmm. Well, yeah, it was like, it was constraints, but we built a broadcast studio with a church attached, and uh, it's turned out really well. 
You know, it was Todd Wilson who said it was something very similar to what you said, and that'll be on the podcast if it hasn't aired already by the time this all, you know, sorts out. Uh, but he made the argument uh, quite compellingly, I thought. Todd Wilson from Exponential, who, who you know. He just said he thinks a lot of the return to church is being driven by exactly what you said. It's like these buildings are big. If you look at most church budgets of smaller churches, and by, you know, that's like sub 1000, which is 98% of churches, is he said they're driven by facilities and staff. And the staff are basically there to facilitate in person experiences at the facilities. And so the pushback is like, how do we fund this thing? if we can't fill it back up. Any thoughts on that? He did a better job articulating that than I just did, but you get the big idea. Um, if, hmm. if, if, let's say 50% of our budget is personnel, maybe 35% of it is facility related. Those are not in common numbers, by the right. way. So 85% of its facilities and people. And all of a sudden you don't have people funding the facilities in the facilities that exacerbates the angst that already exists Well, our whole church model is beginning to fall apart because the yes. model was people, staff supporting people, particularly gathered at a usually a Sunday morning time of hours. And mm. when that model disappears, they start looking around and saying, not only can we not support model A, we don't know where model B is and where to go. So there's a double angst that, my model of gathered people in a facility supported by a heavy staff structure has gone away. We don't know how to replace it or fund it. And we're not sure what model B is. And you talk to pastors today and some of them are struggling with model A right now, which is how do I get that back the way it was instead of looking at what is the future and what is the model that we need? So what would you say to the church leader who's like, no, exactly, Tom. Like, okay, tell me what to do. I've got four staff. I got a $2 million mortgage on this place. And what used to, we used to gather 500 people. And now we're gathering 182 on our best Sunday. What do I do? Well, let's, let's, let's look at, let's do a consultation of that church. And let's say, what do we have? What type of resources do we have? Well, some of the resources that we have are called facilities. They're not going to go away. Is it possible that we can do something differently with those facilities? Is it possible that in, instead of making the facilities for us only, that it could become this type of community center that this, this area does not have? Let's rethink facilities. I know, and, 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 I, and I work with smaller churches a lot, but I know of a church that is, was in a one school town and there was no facility of any type of recreation or gathering for the community. And they, they said, we're going to open up our fellowship hall and it's going to be the community center. And it became the impetus for growth of that church. That's all pre COVID that's three or four years. Yeah, yeah. So what do we, can we look at the facilities in you? Can we rethink if God has given us these resources, what do we do? Is it possible? then another church can use those facilities. I mean, is that heretical that uh, two different churches are in the same facility? I don't think so. Let's, let's look at, at that possibility. And then the hard decision is, what do we do about staff? Yeah. And I don't want to make the church the secular world, but the secular world is leading the way by saying, we're going to have to make some tough decisions. And it doesn't, it, it means that sometimes we will have to make adjustments in personnel that are painful, but it's all about the kingdom and what we need to do to move forward. We are poorly aligned in many of our churches staff wise with what we need to be doing in order to be most effective as a local church. What, uh, what are some of the large churches doing well or poorly by that? I mean, you know, almost mega churches, you know, very large, a thousand plus to uh, mega churches. What, what are they doing well? What are they doing poorly? What they're doing well is most of them have grasped the technology, yeah. to make the worship services and other digital venues really solid. Uh, they, they, they've really 
they've really done an incredible job. And as, as I watch some of these larger churches, they have become lessons for smaller churches. And I've, I've even seen some of the larger church staff members be so gracious as to whether it's YouTube or some other type of means of communication, share some of the best practices, hmm. technology. So the, the, the larger churches have led the way in helping us to understand what technology can do in order for us to see this new mission field that is out there, the digital yeah. mission field. So I commend them for that. They have on the negative side, some of the similar challenges that the other churches do that are focused on people in the building and the churches that are large churches that are moving past that tended to be the multi-site multi-venue churches that weren't trying to fill up so many people into one service or one, one time. Right. So if they, if they have the multi-venue, if they have this 350 here and 200 here are, are multi-site, they are more equipped for this new era. Now, we, we, we could talk about Gen Z. We could talk about younger millennials. Early trends, and I know David Kinnaman would, would uh, affirm a lot of this as, as y'all talk on your podcast, but early trends are is that the, the younger millennials and Gen Z are going to be going to smaller gatherings. Yeah. And so the large churches that are thinking about, it's cliche, getting big by getting smaller are the churches with some of the best practices. The churches that are thinking about getting big by getting bigger are the churches that are going to struggle. Well, trying to fill 3000 seats was hard pre COVID. It'll probably be even more difficult down the road. Right. Yeah. Um, What advantages do small to mid-sized churches have over large churches right now? What would you say like, Oh, this is your opportunity. Well, one is assimilation. Uh, we haven't talked a whole lot about that, but small to mid-sized churches, they tend to know everyone. In mm. church of 200 to 250, as you said, with the smaller church, we know when the Jones aren't there. We know when the new house aren't there, although not many churches have new house in there. In their yeah, there's like three. But mm-hmm. we, we know when they're there. And so assimilation can be highly personal and highly intentional. Uh, it's almost like having a small group. Yeah, you're 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 able to connect with them because you know that they are are there or not there, as the case may be. The smaller churches, I'm I'm going to say this is going to be a cross church size. One of the biggest challenges of churches pre COVID is now the biggest opportunity post quarantine, and that is evangelism. Now that sounds so basic and so maybe even trite, but going into the the quarantine, going into the quarantine, the latest numbers I have is that it took about 75 to 80 of our attenders to see one person reach for Christ in a year. So if you're in a church of 75 or 80, you might see one new believer a year. If you're in a church of 200, you might see two or three new believers. Pretty low. So we, 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 we're losing the battle for, for, for yeah. souls, if I may be crass to, to put it that way. So we're losing that battle. What has happened is in the post-quarantine era, the eyes have been open to the opportunities because of the responses digitally. Hmm. And people have seen neighbors and strangers and people that uh, they never thought would darken the door of our facilities, but they're showing up in these digital services and they're saying, there is a mission fail out there. We can reach people for Christ. And so this is an opportunity for simple, profound, relational evangelism to begin taking place. Hmm. I I love, I love the hope you paint in all of that. Um, What key questions do you think church leaders should be asking themselves right now that maybe you don't hear them asking? One, how am I spending my time? Everybody. So on that note, everybody I talk to is like, I've never been busier. Just, you know, and I get that. I get that. The world's upside down. Talk more about that question. I would tell a pastor or another church leader if they cannot clearly point to five to 10 hours a week 
that is used to reach people who are not followers of Christ, that you're not using your time well. And I'll tell you about an experiment I did way back when, when I was a seminary dean. I took some doctoral students, and uh, I think we had 10 in our seminar. All 10 of them were in declining churches. Maybe that's why they were in a demon seminar on church growth. <laughs> churches. And I said, let's do an experiment. Between now and the next seminar, which I think was three months later, uh, I'm going to ask each of you to be accountable to one another. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. I'm not going to suggest a methodology, but I want you to lead your church and yourself in connecting with people with the gospel. And I want you to be accountable to one another where you are sharing with one another uh, through uh, text messages, or I think we, we used a chat board, through a chat board on how you're doing that every single week. Okay, here are the results. Nine of the 10 churches turned around in three months. I began to do that with all my doctoral students. And now when I do coaching, I do that as well. Hmm. It's not as successful with coaching because they don't get a grade. Right. You know, when, when, when I told them they'd failed, if they didn't do it, they, they, there was a good bit of motivation. <laughs> <laughs> and so one, one, of my, one of my questions would be, how are you spending your time? The tyranny of the urgent is, is more, it's exacerbated during mm -hmm. this era because you're supposed to lead an in-person church, a digital church, and you're supposed to be a referee during a heightened political season. So, and, and, and you've got all these people arguing about different things. And I'm saying, if you're not spending five hours where you are focused on reaching people, whether it's writing a letter, taking, if, if you can meet with someone for coffee, even with your mask on, whatever the case may be, uh, think about how you can connect with people and be intentional about right. for five hours. So one of the first questions I would ask is how are you spending your time? Second question, I'm seeing this a good bit. I would say, how are you leading your family spiritually? Right mm. now we're hearing about a lot of families of pastors and other church leaders that are just falling apart. And what has happened is pastors often segregate family and church. Yes. They say, I need to balance the two. No, you don't. You don't need to balance the two. Your family is a part of the church. Paul mm -hmm. made it very clear. How can you manage your church if you cannot can't manage your family? Yeah. And so the, one of the first duties that you have is to make sure your spouse is okay, that your children are okay. And if you do that, so much more is going to be strengthened. And when I get past question two, usually things have turned around in a pastor's life. That pastor is more evangelistic. That pastor is taking care of the family. Those are the two questions I would ask pastors. I wouldn't even get into, I would eventually, hey, let's start looking at the digital world a little more closely. How can we reach yeah. them? I would do that, but I'd have to get to those two questions first. I want you to, and I know this is a tough question because nobody really knows, but I want you, based on what you've seen so far, to look into the post-quarantine church and world. What's the same? What's different? What do you see? Different is relatively easy. Uh, different is gatherings will be smaller. Attendance will be smaller. Um, that's, that's, that's a hard pill for many church leaders to swallow. Yeah. But attendance is, is, is going to be significantly smaller. So when you say significantly, any ballpark guess? I would say that the typical decline post-COVID is going to be in the 30 to 35, maybe even 40% range. Wow. So a church of 1,000 becomes a church of six or 700. Right. Yeah. Um, again, I'm not totally prescient, so I can... No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm not disagreeing. I'm just clarifying. I, I would probably pick a similar number. Might even, I might even go 50%. And again, there, there will be some, some of those people, they're not gone. They're just not in the room. I might be watching on my porch. I might be at a neighbor's place. I might be doing something different, but the habit forming um, period that we've been in probably isn't going to move people back to their old patterns immediately. Is that what you're thinking? That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Okay. There will be some sameness. Um, 
I have a book coming out way in 2020, 21. It's about this whole issue of attendance. Hmm. Despite everything I said, I'm big on attendance. Now, how you count is one thing and what you're counting is another thing. But being present is, you know, if, if all of a sudden none of our friends or family communicated with us anymore or in our presence anymore, we would think something is wrong. So I will say one of the things that will not change is there will still be a gathered church. It will be a clear manifestation of what we do in church life. Yes, it may be smaller. Definitely it will be augmented digitally, uh, but there will still be an in-person gathered church. That, that will, that will be the same. And on, on the, on the somewhat negative side of what will change, I think for the foreseeable future, pastoral care needs are going to be heightened. Yeah. And, and, you know, what are pastors going to do about that when really many pastors, the church members expect them to have certain spiritual gifts. One is omnipresence. One is omniscience. Another is omnipotence. Yeah. If you, you know, if you could just be everywhere and know everything and have all power, then you would really be a good pastor. And you are, you're a very good pastor. You're also God, but that's okay. You know, <laughs> So I, 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 do, I do think that the pastor needs to be prepared. Church leaders need to be prepared for heightened pastoral care. And maybe even in terms of what we're seeing now, heightened division taking place in the church, we're certainly seeing it in a political season. Mm-hmm. Maybe a less than a little bit in, in 2021, but we're certainly seeing it in a political season. But to be prepared for that. But I do think pastoral care needs will accelerate. I do think the gathered church will be the same. And I do think we will be in a smaller church gathering. Tom, as always, is so helpful. Anything else you want to share with us while we're together today? Well, Carrie, if I haven't communicated it, I want to be clear to your listeners because you have a lot of them. And I want them to hear what I'm about to say clearly, not because Tom Rainer's saying it, but because I really believe that this is the truth. I think this is one of the greatest opportunities that we will ever know in our lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. Seize this as an opportunity. Uh, It's become cliche to say God wasn't surprised by the pandemic, but guess what? God was not surprised by the pandemic. Hmm. And so we're looking on the other side of most of the quarantine. And it is a mission field that I think we have not seen in our lifetime. Yeah. Ask God to open your eyes and then seize the opportunity. Well, that's a good word to finish uh, on. And Tom, people are going to check out your podcast. You've got a lot of writings. You blog regularly. So where can they find all that? Everything is located nice and centrally at churchanswers.com. If they happen to put my name in, tomrainer.com, it'll send them right there to churchanswers.com. Tom, it's been such a gift to have you on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before.